Hi, this is Diane Carbo with Caregiver Relief, and today I have Pat Deegan with me. She's a nurse and a podcast contributor and our end-of-life specialist. And today, Pat and I are going to talk about advanced directives. There's so many questions people have about what is an advanced directive, what questions they should ask, and what do all these questions mean. So Pat and I are going to, as nurses, we're going to give you the good, the bad, and the ugly today. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me, and I want to say thank you for making sure that I got a copy of the five wishes that we've talked about in our our podcast. I think it makes things much simpler. It's like a much easier explanation of a lot of the things. I know you said we we're going to talk about power of attorney, and uh, I think natural death goes along with that. And there are so many questions people don't think about on a normal, average day that you know, really have to be answered. And this is, I hope we can cover some of those today. Yeah, and whatever we don't cover today, we'll cover next week in our next yeah. podcast. Yeah, there's, but there's I want so people- much. There is so much, and one of the things people need to do is they need to think about their health care wishes, and making an advanced directive can and should be done with at any age. The important thing is that you have an honest conversation with your loved ones, and you explain to them what you want or don't want. So, uh, Pat, let's talk about things like what does the five wishes cover? Let's start with that. Which, okay, that comes under like a, a desire for a natural death, which the five wishes brings up, but they don't really use that term. The person who's making this out has to has to be competent, of course, and they're voluntarily making this these decisions known to their physician and to their family and family members. If your condition is terminal and it has been established by, say, one or two physicians and you want to determine at the time of death or when death is near, like, like within a month or so, You have some questions that you definitely want to be answered and to be withheld. One of them is the artificial nutrition and hydration. And the natural death gives you two paragraphs, one that you direct nutrition be provided or that not be provided, and you check which one you want. If you're in a, let's say, a vegetative state, a coma after a stroke or something, and you're permanently unconscious, that would be another condition where you would want these advanced directives to be upheld. Again, it's with the uh, nutrition. It's either to be provided or not be provided, depending on on your wishes. I think when it comes to a vegetative state, there are lots of things to remember or to think about. If you are in one and you're in a hospital, and I think we've talked about this before, they'll insert surgically a feeding tube into your abdomen so that you can be fed artificially, if you will. And this is something that you really have to talk about to your family because they may think this is going to help you get better when indeed it it is not. And when the dying process really begins, if you force food on people because the organs are not functioning properly, it it gives them a lot more pain than we thought before. So that's You know, Pat, that brings up a really good point. What is life support to people? People think, what is life support? And Mm -hmm. they have to understand that a life support such as a ventilator or a feeding tube or hydration of any kind or or CPR, life support replaces a failing body function. So there are times when uh, a patient may have a curable or treatable condition and life support is used temporarily. But Mm -hmm. then until an illness or disease can be stabilized and, and the body can assume or resume um, a normal functioning of, of our systems. But there are times when the body's never going to regain any ability to function without life support. So when you're making a decision on very specific conditions of life support, so you need to gather facts to make informed decisions. There are benefits to treatments and there are burdens to treatments. And people need to understand that a treatment can be beneficial, number one, if it relieves suffering or it restores a function or enhances a quality of life. That's really important. But the same treatment can be burdensome to somebody because it may cause pain or prolong their pain or prolong the dying process, and it doesn't add any benefit to a person's life. In fact, it diminishes their quality of life. So when a person decides to decline life support 
or accept life support, it's got to be on a very deeply personal level. It's important that you gather information about specific treatments. You understand why the treatment is being offered and how it will benefit your care. So let's talk about the different treatments. Let's talk about the benefits and burden of having a, a feeding tube. Okay, and it, I think a lot depends on if the patient is going to die at home or die in a nursing home or, or if it's, they're going to stay in the hospital for a very short term. There's a lot of care to a feeding tube. It has to be flushed after they eat. And as I said before, if you're depending on how much liquid they're getting via the, uh, the feeding tube, it can make the patient extremely uncomfortable. And then you have to worry about the digestive process, the elimination process. Uh, all these things people just do not think about. All they're thinking about is how can I make my loved one happy or you know better and they're not thinking of the total picture of what happens in the dying process number one um, exactly if they're going to be placed in a nursing home because let's face it with today all the corporates think of the bottom line and they're not going to keep someone in the hospital just to have a feeding tube so then you're sent to a nursing home now the question is how long do you want to be in a nursing home do you want to be a burden to your family I mean I look at it very cynically because I've seen too much but that's another question. Does somebody want to be in a nursing home for six months, nine months, or forever until they decide to pull the tube? Yes, I, I do too. And one of the things people don't understand is there may be some minor discomfort when they have this tube inserted. Your digestive system, especially with feeding tubes, causes diarrhea so much, so Absolutely. many patients. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it causes skin breakdown and pressure sores. And then you've got possible infection and skin irritation at the feeding tube site that occurs. Because when you're in this debilitated state, people don't understand that you're already immune compromised. So yeah. even with the artificial nutrition, you're still not up to par with stuff. Exactly. Uh, now, there, and people don't understand that there's a real high risk of aspiration. So a person has oh. to... Think about they have to sit up and they can't be laying down when they're having a, a feeding tube uh, because if they regurgitate the stomach contents, it gets sucked into the lungs. And then we have a, a definite increase in hospitalizations due to pneumonia. Exactly. Very well said. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and then I think you've got to think if the patient is this poor, are they on oxygen? And that's another ball game. Now, of course, yes. today they can have concentrators that the patient can walk around in the house or get in a chair and a little concentrator goes along with them. But just the oxygen alone people worry about because if there are smokers in the house, they just can't come in. It can't be done. There's a lot of things people have to think about that they just don't when you're happy, living well, and healthy. And these are the things I think we're trying to, to promote. But I wanted to talk about harvesting organs, if you don't mind. I would love to hear about that. I think people need to hear about that. Well, I think so many people have donated, say, their eyes when they die, and they have the motor vehicle has a place on your license if you're an organ donor. And I think that's been the accepted vote. Oh, yes, the eyes are fine, but when someone comes into an emergency room with a fatal injury, it is so difficult if there isn't anything, or they might have said be an organ donor. I had the privilege when I worked at the trauma hospital of being involved with harvesting um, organs through it. It's a national network. And it is so sad because you don't want to approach the family because they are, are in such chaos themselves because of this terrible tragedy. But I think there's so many misconceptions about how we, the hospital, was going to treat the body because the patient, in all intents and purposes, has died. And I just need to reassure people that it is done with the most dignity. It is just like somebody going to the OR to have an appendix out or what have you, except that we're taking the eyes, if that's what it was, and if they said everything that can be used, the lungs, the kidneys, the body is restored just like it would be if it had surgery and can have an open casket. There is no way that anybody, the organs had been donated unless the family said so. And I think a lot of people think that, you know, we just don't care. The patient's dead and we'll do it. But that's not the way it is, at least it's not where I had worked. And that's a good point. If you still have something that is working and it could be benefit somebody else, mm -hmm. that's a very positive thing. It's Absolutely. a way of keeping the memory of your loved mm -hmm. one alive by helping somebody else. Yep. And I think that's a really a great uh, point to make. I also... 
or no, I was going to say, yes. if you watch any television, at least recent months and years, you'll see somebody that's going to meet a person that got the uh, other person's heart, and they feel the heart, and it's so good for them because they feel part of him is still alive, and those are the good benefits. Yes. Yeah. Now, let's talk about putting a person on a ventilator. You have to really consider, do you put a person mm-hmm. on a ventilator, or do you not to put them on a ventilator and what are the ramifications of that for the family. I have to tell you, I did rehab nursing and we had a lot of young people put on ventilators. It's a difficult thing to do. Uh, So let's talk about that a little bit, Pat. You and I both have seen the good, bad, and ugly about that as well. Yeah, we certainly have. (laughs) And I think just with recent things with the COVID, the amount of people yes. that were put on ventilators, they were elderly or they had significant other conditions, not just the COVID. Generally speaking, and there are exceptions to every rule, somebody they'll say post-operative after having surgery might be put on a vent, but it's very short term, like maybe one or two days to give the body and the lungs and everything a chance. And then they start to wean the person off. And this is a good time that they might ventilate just so that he has enough oxygen so that the brain can still function. But taking them off might, might take a day or something, and then nothing happens. The patient starts to breathe on his own. That's one place where an intubation would be good. In the emergency room, we used to see them. We weren't sure what was wrong with them. When they came in and it was just massive, they would intubate them because they couldn't breathe on their own. Um, I, let me see. When you, I cannot tell you how many people I have seen in their 80s and 90s oh. Oh. that have been on mechanical ventilation. Mm-hmm. And yep. it just really breaks my heart to see it. Usually it's irreversible respiratory failure because of a, an injury to the spinal cord or maybe a progressive neurological disease. I have seen people that have had long-term mechanical ventilation, and they do have some quality of life. But for the the dying patient, mechanical ventilation often just extends the dying process. And it's very irritating. It irritates the windpipes and all that stuff. If they are, we'll say, semi-alert, they can't really talk on a ventilator. It's very difficult for them. And they really struggle. They really do. And families, for some reason, either choose not to uh, recognize this because the person is alive, but eventually they realize, I hope, and most of the time they do, that it really is something that is just keeping them alive, and that's all. And if they just let him go, he's a lot more comfortable. There are some family members, and I see this on Facebook all the time, Pat. There's actually mm-hmm. groups where hospice killed my family member. People don't understand that mechanical ventilation or even feeding tubes prolong pain. Mm-hmm. I have seen family members just not be able to let go. They just right. are not able to and let go. They're not ready. And, no, they're not. No. And they're not ready. And there are skilled nursing units that are nothing but patients on ventilators. Yes. It, it's hard because you can keep somebody at home with a ventilator, but it, it, it's a lot of work and you have to worry about so many things like 24 hour care turning them every two or three hours because if they're on a ventilator, most likely they're not able to do that themselves. Then you have the problem of uh, skin care and breakdown. The thing with a ventilator is it doesn't improve the underlying condition. It right. just to, to, to supply oxygen to the body. Well, I think at a time like this, some people just have to be able to make sure that they they discuss, if I can't breathe on my own or I can't eat on my own or mm-hmm. I can't return to a quality of life that's acceptable to me, please right. don't extend my life. Yeah, that's so true because, again, like you said earlier, they're, the people are being selfish because they don't want to lose them and they haven't had the time sometimes to accept the fact that their parent or loved one is in the process of dying. So, oh, do everything that you can to help them, but you're not helping them really. You're just making, prolonging the, the difficulty for them. Exactly. And I think the other thing is if you're on a ventilator, what if you lose electricity? Now, unless you've got an outside uh, backup generator. Generally, at least years ago, the DME companies, uh, that would be on their list if the power went out, who had well, like a respirator or an oxygen or something at home, and that would be the first place they'd go. But not everybody has a backup. Look at what happened at the hospitals during Katrina in New Orleans. Oh they had no electricity. 
electricity, and they were yep. hand bagging hand, yep, people. Yep, bagging the people. Um, I know it. Begging the people, trying to keep them alive, and it just breaks your heart to know that people are struggling. And I think this is why it's so important to have early and often discussions about end-of-life issues. Again, I'm telling people, what you want at 20 is not what you want at 30, 40, 50, or 60. So your thoughts and, and, and feelings about things change. So it's important that people realize that you can put in an advanced directive in place but I think it's important uh, to revisit it and revisit it often, mm-hmm. at least yearly. But if, if if you're a person that procrastinates, at least every 10 years, where when you change a decade from mm-hmm. 20 to 30 to 40, because as you age, you start to experience different uh, health mm-hmm. issues, chronic illnesses. You're diagnosed with cancer or breathing problems like COPD, uh, heart problems. Here's an, a, a perfect example People that have pacemakers or defibrillators, they have to make that decision when do they want it to be turned off Mm -hmm. Uh, because do they want to be zapped? We talked about in one of the previous podcasts about the DNI, do not intubate. People have a hard time, family members have a hard time. What do you mean we're, we're going to turn the pacemaker off or the defibrillator off? You You're know, right. it's, yeah. do you want yeah. that person's heart to continue? I've seen people say, if a time comes, I want a do not intubate order mm-hmm. because I don't want my life sustained. If my heart's not right. working and it's yeah. only by artificial means that I'm staying alive, then please yeah. don't intubate me. Yeah, I think people tend to forget it's the quality of life that's left, not the quantity. And I, I think over and over again, if someone doesn't want to be hooked up to something and they're restricted in all their daily activities, to them that might not be living and they would just as soon be gone because there's no quality of doing the things that they want to do or are capable of doing. Exactly. A perfect example is kidney dialysis is a life support treatment when it uses special machines. And some people think that dialysis is not a cure for kidney failure. It definitely is not. Mm -hmm. If your kidneys stop working and there's no chance for them to return, you cannot live without one. Decide if kidney Mm -hmm. dialysis is something that you want. Now, the the thing with kidney dialysis is such a commitment of time. Oh my it's God. three or four days a week of sitting four to eight hours eight hour. yep. every week. And for many people, the benefits of that dialysis and the quality of life they experience as a result outweighs the burden. But mm-hmm. for some, for me, I would be like, no way, Jose. No, me too. No, I don't want to sit. I don't want to be in the hospital all the time. Oh, I don't I want mean, no. life-sustaining and treatment like that. People will do maybe for the most, maybe one or two years, but then they just get to the point where it really is just too much for them. Now they're doing home-to-home now. On certain yes. patients. But again, that yes. takes the caregiver out of their whole day to watch this and keep an eye on it. And it's, you're just prone to so many complications, infection or what have you. Exactly. And you know what the other thing people don't realize when they go on dialysis is they may have to have a very strict fluid intake yep. and they're and on a very fluid. strict diet. Yes. Yeah. And they can't cheat. They really can't because they become. So people get tired of that. When I want a good drink, I want a good drink. And Mm -hmm. to to know that all I can have is like four, six, eight ounces of fluid in one day is really hard for some people. It would be terribly hard for me. I'm a big drinker. I would have a hard time with dialysis. Uh, Again, if you have kidney failure and it's for short term, that's fine. But Again, it's a discussion if it's going to be long-term that you have to have with your family members unless, you know, because you cannot live without a kidney unless you get a kidney transplant. And as you get older, you don't qualify for kidney transplant. Mm, That's right. And I don't think people realize that. And it's a commitment to family, especially if they're done at home with a husband or the wife. They have to be just as committed. And all our lives we've been taught drink eight glasses of water a day, every day, eight and now all of a sudden, no, you can't have that anymore. And most, yeah. a lot of times, whether it's because they know they can't, these people are constantly thirsty. 
They're always craving. Yeah. So you, you stay away from anything salty, like if they like a potato chips. Oh, sorry, you can't have that ham. All these restrictions, and nobody thinks of those generally when you're yes. making a decision like that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And and that's the other thing, except with the, the feeding tube. Like I've said before, I've seen so many people say to me, oh, my gosh, if I'd known that I wasn't going to be able to eat, I wouldn't yes. have done this. Once it right. was walking and talking, because not to be able to – eat ever again is very uh, difficult for some people. I know for me, I love to eat. Well, you know, that's one of the I, pleasures of life. <laughs> Let's it, face it. Is, yeah. it is. And I've had so many seniors. All they want is a little bit of ice cream. I always giggle at the family members uh, at the nursing homes when somebody's celebrating their 98th birthday or 100th <laughs> birthday, and the family says, oh, you can't eat your birthday cake until you eat some dinner first. But at that age, I'm like, first of all, I'm saying, I'm going to have dessert first, man. Yeah, I, that's really funny because... My husband used to hide all the sweets when I was working, and I'd come home, and I'd wonder, where did all this go? But he'd always say, oh, not me, but um, he'd hide them. He'd be, he'd be walking back, and he'd be hiding them in his pocket or something. And I always knew he was, you know. Was, he was a severe it, diabetic. Yeah, but he just could not help himself. That's what he wanted. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is, at a certain age, it comes to quality of life versus right. quantity. And if people want to severely restrict their diet, that's up to them. Yeah, but again, yeah. it's a conversation that you have to have. It, it's with everybody, your family members, your healthcare providers, your specialists. These are conversations that you need. We've talked about the life support and common life support things. We're talking about the living will and advanced directives, but I would like to touch base on what a pulsed is. The physician ordered life sustaining treatment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I'm just going to mention that a pulse is a portable medical order. It means that it's something that you carry around with you that is valid outside a doctor's office or clinic. And it's like similar to a drug prescription. And it's a process that's part of advanced care planning. It's something else that you have to have a conversation. But that's something we're going to definitely cover at another time. But I think that we've done pretty good today as far as discussing all the issues in regards to end of life. I will okay. say that we will be discussing the importance of end of life curative versus palliative care and hospice in the future. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think those are issues that we're going to need to discuss But, again, I just want to reiterate to everybody that I hope we help you answer the difficult questions and that you'll check out Caregiver Relief's website uh, to learn how to make choices in regards to hydration, nutrition, and breathing for those advanced um, directives as you age. Pat, I'm going to end today with saying thank you very much for being here. I'm going to... To my caregivers, remember, you okay. are the most important part of the caregiving equation. Without you, it all falls apart. Please practice self-care every day. Be gentle with yourself because you are worth it. And next week, Pat, I think we'll talk about pulse and some hospice okay. and palliative care issues. Okay. That'll work. All right.